Locked up indefinitely? No lawyer? No trial? If you think this can't happen to an American citizen, think again. We have disrupted an unfolding terrorist plot to attack the United States by, the, by exploding a radioactive dirty bomb. I get a phone call in the car. The prosecutor calls up, he says, your, your client was taken by the military. And I thought they were joking. Um, thank you, but no comment at this time. Newman's client, Jose Padilla, had been held as a material witness for an entire month before Ashcroft's dramatic announcement. He had been charged with no crime, but was seen as someone who could provide information to a grand jury about 9-11. Suddenly, he was being called a terrorist. We know that Abdullah al-Mujahir is an al-Qaeda operative. Broadcasting live from Moscow, Ashcroft announced the arrest as if Padilla had just been caught and a terrorist act narrowly averted. Let me be clear. We know from multiple independent and corroborating sources. Nothing had happened from the time of his arrest four weeks before till his designation. And the information that they had was the same. So one has to think, okay, so then what changed? And I wanted to point out to uh, Director Mueller that that Just prior to Ashcroft's announcement, FBI whistleblower Colleen Rowley had been appearing before Congress. She was testifying about the lack of intelligence sharing between the FBI and CIA and how they'd bungled the warnings that might have prevented 9-11. We need to streamline the FBI's bureaucracy in order to more effectively combat terrorism. Um, let me just start off by saying... Now that Rowley's issues seem passe, as the Justice Department kept emphasizing that interagency collaboration had led to Padilla's capture and the country saved from a terrorist attack. It was a result of the close cooperative uh, work of FBI agents and CIA agents. Close cooperation among U.S. government agencies. But what had all this cooperation yielded? Within hours, I mean 24 hours, the government then had news conferences in which they backtracked. They said, well, it wasn't really a plot, you know, it was just like in the talking stages. I want to emphasize again, there was not an actual plan. There were discussions about uh, this uh, possible plan, and it was in the discussion stage. It certainly wasn't at the point of having a specific target. What's remarkable is when you read the government's papers is that they insist that the government does not have to charge Mr. Padilla with a crime. They don't really have any evidence of any crime. They have a notion that he might have met with people from Al-Qaeda, but they don't think he's a member, and they've said so in court papers. So what was the sudden urgency? The cynical among us might believe it was to deflect Rowley's damaging information. The government wasn't saying. And with Padilla now locked up in solitary confinement in a naval brig in South Carolina, he wasn't able to explain anything either. Some information about Padilla began to surface. As a teenager in Chicago, Padilla's involvement in a murder committed by an older gang member landed him in juvenile detention. He later moved to Florida, and when he was 21, he went to prison for 10 months after firing a gun into the air during an argument. Upon his release, he converted to the Islamic faith at a center known for preaching nonviolence. Over the next 10 years, his only run-ins with the law were for minor traffic violations. His new religion would take him to the Middle East, where he married his second wife. On a return trip to the United States, he was taken into custody. Mr. Padilla was arrested at Chicago O'Hare Airport. He was initially detained under the material witness statute, and only after they could no longer hold him under that statute did they then label him as an enemy combatant. Padilla's activities and his association with al-Qaeda make him an enemy combatant. An enemy combatant? I didn't, what, what, where did you make up that term? You know, I really had never heard of it. I thought the administration's rules on military tribunals said they would be only for non-American citizens. Is the, is the whole point of holding him uh, in, in, as a military combatant to be able to question him without using conventional criminal process? Uh, his status, as the Attorney General said in his statement, is as an enemy combatant. He is being detained under the laws of war as an enemy uh, combatant. And if the President labels them an enemy combatant, or in President Bush's words, a bad guy, they can be held indefinitely, incommunicado, without a hearing, without charges. Congress has already ruled on this. Congress said, you can't ever use our military for domestic law enforcement purposes. We don't want you doing that. We don't want you to use the military to arrest citizens. We don't want martial law. And this president and this attorney general says, I don't have to follow the rules. 
Does he have legal representation at the moment? Uh, the, uh, he was being held under uh, the authority of a federal judge, um, and he had legal rep representation uh, in connection with that. Yes. Does Larry, he now? How Does far he did now? they get? I called the Department of Defense. I even called the White House. I got the response. He will not be able to call me. I will not be able to call him. I will not be able to visit him. And while, of course, I can write to him, they would not guarantee that he would receive my mail. Although the government now claims that Padilla may have been involved in a plot to blow up apartment buildings, they have provided no evidence nor charged him with a crime. The detention of an American citizen indefinitely without counsel is based not only on hearsay, could be triple hearsay for all we know, but they admit that one of the individuals who gave the information has lied to them in the past, has his own agenda for giving information, and the other, inf the other informant, in quotes, recanted. We've never in the history of the United States had investigative detention. We, we, don't, we don't do that, you know, except now we do. Recently, the Supreme Court decided that enemy combatants such as the Guantanamo prisoners and Jose Padilla have the right to an attorney and access to a court of law. It remains to be seen how the government will comply with this ruling. The accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial and be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. The Sixth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Every step of the way, we've heard John Ashcroft tell the public, trust us, we're the government. And yet he refuses to release important information that the public needs in order to understand what's at stake. Government claims of secrecy can rightfully be viewed with suspicion. And the secret, 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 as we have learned in history, generally, it's they're hiding their lack of evidence. Korematsu is a perfect example. Korematsu is when the, the Japanese were interned based on the government's allegation that these people were dangerous and had to be put in internment camps indefinitely until the war was over. Subsequently, after the war, everybody now knows that the information that the government gave to the court was false. They misled the court on purpose. And the rest of the information, of course, they said is secret, secret, secret. And the secret, secret, secret was, we don't have anything. 